Hello Internet! I'm finally back! And in this video, I'll show the 3D printing of the Raziel statue. Raziel is the main character of the Soul River games from the Legacy of Kane series. My favorite games of all time. This was one of the longest projects I ever done. I started this back on 2017 and I'm finally finishing it now in 2021. It's finally over. During the project, I learned a lot about 3D printing and how to finish and paint my 3D prints. Of course, I'm just a beginner and I still have a lot to learn, but I decided to share here all my journey, everything I learned during the whole process, including mistakes and good choices I made. So hopefully this video is gonna be informative for you. So let's jump into it. You probably will remember this vampire form of Raziel from the intro of Soul River, but this Raziel statue was actually extracted from the game called Nosgoth. Nosgoth was a spin-off game from the Legacy of Kane series that was unfortunately cancelled a few years ago. Before the game was cancelled though, I was able to use U-Model 2 to extract Raziel's statue that existed in the Fane map of Nosgoth. If you are interested in extracting 3D models and animations from games, I already made a series of tutorials describing these methods step by step, so don't forget to check it out. The links to the tutorials will be in the video description below. Before I could start printing this extracted model, I found many problems that could cause trouble during the print. One problem I found, for example, is that the model wasn't fully solid. It had non-manifold geometry that made the surface split into internal meshes. Models with that problem may show complications during the printing, so I fixed the issues using Tinkercad and Blender modeling software. I also made a tutorial showing this fixing method, so if you want to learn how I fixed those problems, don't forget to check the tutorial playlist in this channel. Another problem was that DaVinci Jr., the 3D printer that I used in this project, it was a very cheap printer, it cost about $200, but being so cheap, it had its limitations, of course. It had a really small printing area. The height limit is about 15 centimeters, and I wanted to print the statue with around 24 or 25 centimeters of height. So I had to split the model into multiple parts. For splitting the model into parts, you can use tools like Mesh Mixer or Tinkercad. Both tools can do the job. In my case, I did the split using Tinkercad, and I already posted another tutorial video here in this channel showing how to do this kind of splitting. So don't forget to check it out if you're interested. Finally, if your model has an overhang which is not supported by anything below, you need to include additional 3D printing support structures to ensure a good print. And this model is very complex, so it has many overhangs. So I could either use the default supports generated by the DaVinci proprietary slicer software, or I could generate some custom supports with Mesh Mixer. The advantage of using Mesh Mixer for generating the custom supports is that they can be optimized for minimizing the waste of material while maximizing the quality of the print. I never tried the custom supports from Mesh Mixer before, so I decided to give it a shot. So the three like structures that you see during the prints are support structures generated by Mesh Mixer. My feedback on them is indeed the custom supports save a lot of material, but the problem is that when the model has too many complex overhangs, the custom support structures can be very messy. So my final conclusion is meh, not bad, not great. Whenever I print this model a second time, I think I would go back to the default supports. It wastes a bit more filament, but it doesn't need so much tweaking of parameters and manual editing. So once I got all those problems figured out, I finally had my model ready to print. It was split into parts and with the custom supports already added. My first prints have failed though, because the model didn't stick to the printing bed. What solved this problem for me was a combination of adding blue tape to the printing bed and including a brim of about 8mm around the model as a platform adhesion method. Finally, after that, my prints went more smoothly. So the whole project consisted of printing 5 parts. The top and bottom half of Raziel's body, his arm, his cape, and the base where Raziel will be standing on. From those parts, only the cape and the base didn't need any support materials, all the rest required supports. I'll be sharing all these models in Thingiverse, including the versions with and without supports, so you can customize and print them however you like. 
So my plan here was to have square holes in each part and connect them with little 3D printed boxes. But unfortunately the mesh mixer supports have messed up everything and fused with the holes. That's why you see me doing some reconstruction with epoxy putty here. Epoxy putty is very useful for filling some large gaps between print lines and to fix large imperfections as well. It can decrease the amount of sanding you have to do, so you see me adding epoxy to the irregular surfaces in the model. One advice here though, be careful with the amount of epoxy you add because you may eliminate details in the model. The details may go away with the imperfections. I think I may have added too much epoxy putty here in some parts of the model, but a good thing is that if you add too much epoxy you can always go back and sand it again. You can keep going back and forth between epoxy and sanding cycles until you are satisfied with the balance between smoothness and the amount of detail in the model. After I fixed all the major problems with the mesh mixer supports, I finally start sanding and gluing all the parts. To glue the parts together, I'm using some general purpose super glue. I have used both liquid and gel forms of super glue, and the gel ones are easier to handle. And for printing in the Da Vinci Junior, I use PLA that is a popular 3D printing material produced from renewable resources. I printed all parts of Raziel at 210 degrees Celsius, setting a layer height of 0.20 mm, 20% of ink fill, and a low printing speed between 15 and 25 mm per second. Here the color of the filament doesn't really matter for me that much, because I'll be sanding, priming and painting this model anyways, so printing all parts took about 36 hours to print non-stop, not including the failed prints of course. But printing is just the beginning. If you think that 36 hours of printing is a long time, then get ready for all the sanding, priming and painting process. I would say that the actual extraction, pre-processing and printing of the 3D models is the easiest part. It's nothing compared to the amount of work spent on finishing the printed model. If you print your models with ABS plastic instead of PLA, you may be able to save some sanding time by running an acetone vapor bath on your print. But in my case, I printed everything on PLA, so I could not avoid all the sanding process. And regardless of what material you use, there are always some remaining support structures still sticking to the print. And you have to carefully remove them without causing any damage. I tried to remove the support parts that were easier to remove with tweezers and pliers, but for some persistent supports, those tools weren't enough. So for the persistent remaining supports, I used a rotary tool. The rotary tool solved the problem for me. To start sanding, I always use 100 or 200 grit sandpaper first, and I always go from the most coarse grit to the most fine grit, gradually all the way to 800 or 1000 grit when I'm finishing the finer details of the model. No matter how good is your printer, if it uses this technology, also known as Fused Deposition of Material or FDM, the best resolution it can print is around 0.10 mm. And even if you use the best resolution, you can still see the horizontal lines in the print, which are a consequence of the insufficient precision of the printing method. I get really upset when I see those lines after printing and finishing the model, so I'm very paranoid about it and you see me using many laborious techniques here in my attempt to eliminate all those FDM imperfections. After I was done removing all major imperfections with the 200 grit sandpaper, I finally start to spray some primer on the model. I'm using a sandable filler primer for that, and between each layer of primer, I'm sanding again with a finer sandpaper, as in the gradual process I mentioned it before. In the end, it was a total of 4 or 5 sanding and priming cycles, always letting the primer dry for many hours before sanding again. Resin printing has much better resolution than FDM printers and now their prices are much more accessible. So if you are annoyed by those imperfections in FDM like me, a resin printer may be the best choice now. I'm planning to buy a resin printer anytime soon, so stay tuned and subscribe to this channel to see my new experiments. And if you are interested in time-lapse video making, for making the time-lapse videos you see in this channel, I started recording the first ones with a cheap Samsung Galaxy S4 cell phone I bought used from eBay. Then later I moved to a camcorder from Sony. 
Most of the time-lapse footage you see here in this video were made with that camcorder. But the camcorder and cell phone camera and sensors are very small, what makes them terrible for low-light environments. That's what I realized a long time later and made me regret my purchase decision. So I would have to buy better lights, but I didn't have much space at that time. And I also tried a GoPro before, but then I realized that the sensor size was similar to the camcorder and it turned out worse because the GoPro overheats after 30 minutes recording. So after much trial and error, I finally had to spend some extra money to buy an APS-C sensor camera. That camera works much better in low light. It's a Sony Alpha 6400, so in the last part of this video you see the better camera in action. After I added a final layer of black primer, I started painting the skin and the face of the model. I'm a beginner in painting miniatures, so it took a lot of trial and error and watching a lot of tutorials to finally getting this right. I will leave a link in the description of this video to many useful miniature painting tutorials I have followed. Painting the eyes for me was the most difficult part of this statue. For doing that, you have to use very small paint brushes and be very careful. This is for sure a very time-consuming process, but there is an easy alternative for beginners like me. You can simply print the eyes in a water slide decal paper and stick it to the statue. So you can use either a laser jet or inkjet printer to print on a special type of paper that will slide into any surface once you soak it in water. Then you just paint some additional details on top of it. The water slide decal method gave me the best results considering my beginner skill level in painting miniatures. So if you wanna try this method, I'll leave a comment here below showing where I bought this decal paper. For painting the skin, I tried many different paints. Raziel has a very light skin, so I would have to make a custom mix of mostly white paint and then just add a little bit of darker tones like brown, red and yellow. I tried a mix of these colors with Testor's paint, which I didn't like at all, because the animals were too glossy. The animals paint smoother and more uniform than the acrylics, but they give a more glossy effect. Part of this was my mistake though, because I only had glossy animals when I started painting the skin. And I even test this mix first on a piece of plastic like a plastic spoon or a cup and it did look fine there, but I didn't like the final result when I put the paint on the model. It looked too artificial because of the glossiness, it looked like a toy. So later on the painting process you notice that I paint the skin again and again experimenting with different paints. And I finally like the result and stick with it at the end. The paint that gave me the best results was a group of acrylics, a combination of snow titanium white and cherry red from Americana mixed with raw sienna and burnt sienna from folk art. Using mostly the snow white color and a little bit of each darker tone gave me the perfect pale skin color I wanted for Raziel. For painting the rest it was much easier. For the clothes we basically have a red fabric and black leather, so I used opaque acrylics for those. For the red color I noticed it's much better to start painting on top of a black layer. If I paint on top of a white layer for example, I'll need to paint too many layers too many times to get the darker red shades I wanted. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention about the acrylic paints from Folk Art and Americana is that before they dry the color and textures of these paints may look totally different. You may have noticed that while I'm painting the red and brown parts of Raziel's clothes, at the beginning they look very glossy. But later, after I paint many layers and let them dry for an hour or two, they turn darker and the glossiness totally disappears. Protective coats of varnish can be used to adjust the glossiness as well. For example, even after the paint dries, if you think it's still too glossy, you can go ahead and apply a transparent matte varnish coat and the glossiness will disappear completely. Or if the paint is too opaque for you after drying and you want to make it a bit more glossy, you can simply apply a transparent glossy varnish coat. So the varnish coats can be very useful for adjusting that as well. For the armor pieces I use a metallic gold enamel for most of the parts. It was a gold enamel from Testors. And then I use the acrylic silver from Testors for the shoulder armor piece. Whenever you paint metallics, you need to paint on top of a glossy black coat. Otherwise it's gonna be difficult to get the proper metallic effect. So I started with very light coats on top of the glossy black first and then I left all the remaining coats for later, whenever I finish painting all the non-metallic parts. 
For painting this coal, I took the light opaque skin tone that I made for Raziel's skin and I added a lot more of white color to it. This generated an opaque light beige color perfect for painting bones. Since the background layer here was totally black, it took me many coats to get the uniform texture I was looking for. I probably should have sprayed a little bit of white primer for those parts that needed a light color background and also for making some shading effects it could be useful but I only learned about that when I was about to finish all painting so I'll leave this technique for the next project Metallic parts can be a little bit messy because they release some dust while they're still fresh so I recommend either leaving them for the last stages of your painting or paint them first and then when they dry add a layer of protective varnish on top of them Gotta be careful for the varnish not to screw up the metallic effect though It must be a glossy varnish for animals if you are using metallic animals or a crystal clear acrylic coat if you are working with metallic acrylics Another lesson I learned is that whenever you finish painting one coat or one layer of details go ahead and add a varnish layer on top of it Here I'm always adding a transparent matte finish varnish coat after each detail painting step These varnish coats are like a checkpoint For example, if you like the details you painted in the previous step and you don't add varnish on top and then you make a terrible mistake on top of it then it's gonna be very difficult to remove that mistake without removing the previous details that you liked so the varnish coats do a checkpoint protecting the details you already added making your mistakes on top of it easier to remove when I got to paint the platform where Razia will be standing on I already learned the lesson of applying a white layer background under any parts that need light colors in this case we have light colors in the face and arm of this human the hair, the clothes and the floor were easy to paint on top of a black background layer because I chose dark brown shades for them so after I added a white background for the human skin I just had to darken a little bit the light skin color mix I used for Raziel before I added a bit more red and brown to look like he was wounded as well finally I wanted more vivid details for this boring base so I put some cool miniature terrain rocks and artificial grass to make things more fun to stick the rocks and the artificial grass here I applied the good old super glue and I just had to drop the rocks around the floor of the base and for the grass I used tweezers to make tufts to simulate little bushes or clusters of mold and Raziel's pose tells me he was celebrating his victory so he should look dirty after fighting in a difficult battle so I used a little trick here for the final touch I took black oil paint dissolved with terpenoid and I applied it over everything and I removed the excessive amounts from more exposed surfaces with a big paintbrush to give some aging effect on his clothes I did the same thing but using brown oil paint mixed with terpenoid and I did the same thing for the base as well this gave a nice aging and dirty effect to the whole statue for painting Razia Lim clan symbol in the cape it was another adventure I started by painting the outline of the symbol while looking at a picture of it as a reference and then when I was finally satisfied with the basic outline I started painting the whole symbol with white acrylic paint I also tried the water slide decal but it doesn't work very well in regular surfaces like the cape For the silver armor pieces, like the one in the shoulder and in the chest I tried a few different techniques I tried applying light coats, heavy coats, enamels, acrylics and I end up sticking with a heavy coat of metallic acrylic applied with a paintbrush but I'm pretty sure I could have gotten better results by using an airbrush similar to the technique I'll show by the end of this video whenever I'm repainting the sword but metallic paints are so messy and I would have to spend so much work masking everything with blue tape that I decided that the cost benefit of repainting everything with airbrush wasn't that worthy so I just end up staying with the paintbrush heavy coats I applied before but the next time I paint silver armor parts I'll definitely try to apply the airbrush technique so I can get better results for painting the sword I wanted a shiny metal mirror effect I tried many different metallic paints but finally the one that gave me the best results was airbrushing a metal chrome paint from spastics on top of a glossy black layer from Allclad the problem of this method is that I couldn't find any varnish that wouldn't screw up the mirror chrome effect 
so I had to leave the sword paint unprotected. Hopefully this paint is resistant enough and won't fall apart over time. I may still paint some more details on the sword, but for now, I'll leave the project like this. My plan now is to upgrade to a resin printer to achieve much better resolutions. The better resolutions will allow me to reduce the amount of priming and sanding steps while maximizing the amount of details. Whenever I get my new resin printer, I'll print a new Raziel statue and I'll make a detailed comparison between resin printing and FDM printing. Of course, with minimal sanding and priming, it will be much easier to print all characters from the legacy of Kane games, including Nosgoth. So stay tuned for my new projects. So that's it, I hope you have enjoyed this video. If this video was useful for you, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe and leave a comment below. See you next time, bye!